Pencil in your paper. Followed in the radical revolutionary movement, ended up on the beaches of North Africa, worshiping the sun, howling at the moon. His life was changed, though, and Jed is currently speaking regularly in churches, at businessmen's groups, at camp meetings. Huntington House recently published his book, Who Will Rise Up? We're glad Jed Smock joined us today. Here's the book, and here's Jed Smock. Jed, good to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to have you here, brother. Well, I'm pleased to be here. I know you've been through a lot of things in this uh, process. I was looking through your book uh, and, and reading through it and looking at the photos, a lot of photographs. You look different then. Uh, long hair and uh, yes, a lot of kind of stuff. hair over my shoulders, a big bushy beard. Back you became part era. of the establishment now. What what happened to? What, well, tell me. Let's go through the routine of a little bit of what where you came from and how you got into all that. You were a professor. Yes, I taught history at the University of Wisconsin, but I went out to San Francisco in the late '60s, and that was when the Haight Ashbury hippie thing was at its height. And one Sunday afternoon, I went to one of these rock and roll concerts, and <laughs> someone offered me some marijuana, and I was foolish enough to try it. Uh, As a saying went in those days, I turned on, tuned in, and dropped out. And eventually uh, yeah. ended up on the beaches of North Africa in the country of Morocco, uh, worshiping the sun. I was into transcendental meditation. And much like the demonic of the Gadarenes, I had ripped off my clothes, was running <laughs> the beaches naked. When on Christmas Day of 1971, the Lord sent an Arab Christian, an exactly. Arab Christian, wow. down to the beach carrying a cross in preaching in the name of the Lord. Right. Many mocked and laughed, but I got to considering and considering my ways and, and uh, thinking how little I really knew about the Bible or Christianity, even though I'd been brought up in the church. And there on the beaches of North Africa, I began to read the scriptures. And like the prodigal son, I came to myself and said, I will rise up. <laughs> and I returned to my home in Terre Haute, Indiana, where in August of 1972, I heard an old high school classmate of mine, Clyde Swalls, who had become a, uh, a minister, and he was down there on the uh, uh, witnessing to the youth that were hanging out that night in revelry, and we went across the street to the Burger King restaurant, home of the Whopper, and he opened up the scriptures to me, and that night in the Burger King, I found the King of Kings. Uh. Wow, what a story. <laughs> let, me, let me just digress, and let's digress and also go forward for a moment. The 60s were an interesting time. I was, uh, I was never part of the hippie movement, and yet I watched all that go on. And it was interesting to me to, to see that happen. And then now we look forward as through the 70s and now into the 80s, kind of the yuppie generation has taken over. And yet a lot of the same, I mean, the ideology is somewhat different. Nobody's, uh, you know, burning uh, uh, the president in effigy these days, it seems, and uh, talking about Vietnam and all that stuff. In fact, we've kind of gotten into a little bit of uh, laziness with uh, both our morals, although the morality seems to be rising uh, primarily because of a negative response to AIDS and some other things. But it seems to me that we really haven't, we haven't gotten to the point of the problem. Uh, the 60s are no longer, the, I mean, the 80s are no longer the 60s, but the same problems still are prevalent in the 80s that were there in the 60s. And all we need is another uh, Vietnam or something like that for it to, I think, explode once again. What what are the answers for today's youth generation who are caught up into the, uh, into the yuppie flow, into the fact of making a lot of money? And, you know, it's really turned around on that side because then nobody wanted any money. Nobody wanted to work. Nobody wanted to do anything. Now it's kind of like I want to be a banker. I want to be a doctor or a lawyer so I can have a lot of money so I can have all the stuff. But it's, it's the same basic philosophy, I think, that drives us to that, which is uh, me, me. And it's, it's the me kind of philosophy. And how do you see the differences, and what are the answers to that? Well, I believe one of the primary problems uh, is uh, in education and what is being taught in our public schools and the universities. Uh, this year, we're celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Northwest Ordinance. And the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 said, uh, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind uh, uh, schools uh, will always be promoted by our society. But the problem is our society has taken religion uh, and, and morality uh, out of our school system today, and there needs to be a restoration. And that's why God has sent me back to the universities, to the college and university campuses, to proclaim the Word of God. And my manner is an unusual one. I just go to the center of campus around the noon hour, find the chief place of concourse. Uh -huh. Typically, it'll be in front of the uh, student union and begin uh, preaching uh, the Word of God. 
uh, calling the students to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And within a few minutes, several hundred students have gathered around me. And of course, mm. the Word of God causes no small stir on the campuses because <laughs> it sure. contradicts the humanistic philosophies that they're learning in the classroom. Well, now, so so, do you see uh, a great difference in the in the young people of the '60s when you were back there and the young people of today? Am I right in in trying to say that uh, the the philosophy of what they're after is different in a sort, but the same root problems that existed then are still existent today? And that is, of course, not looking to God as the answer of all things, but. Is that true? I mean, yes, I agree with you. Are, are, we on, are we on a powder keg of sorts, and when something uh, happens maybe in the Persian Gulf or something happens in Nicaragua and the war starts again, are we going to see that same kind of thing, only maybe not with long hair this time, but the same kind of problems will exist where there will be an eruption in this country of uh, young people? Well, certainly this is a, a self-centered uh, generation, and if, even if there should be a war, I have a, a real concern whether uh, uh, our young people would be willing to fight for their country today. I think you're right. I mean, I think I agree with that. Now, your ministry is to the young people primarily today. Yes. And can you minister to them better because you were once them and doing the thing with the long hair and out there on the beach and, and doing going through all the, the drug problem and all uh, that? Well, Are you able to minister to them better because of that? Uh, in a sense, perhaps. But I would hate to... I think I would have been able to minister to them much more effectively if I had been studying the Word of God <laughs> and preparing myself all of those years, whether in getting stoned and drunk and, and fornicating. So, uh, well, I, I, was, I was asking that question because I grew up in the church, and I thought, well, I'd never have a testimony because I, you know, I was always a pretty good kid, and always, I was always made to walk the line and never rebelled heavily, but uh, I always thought, well, I'd never been on drugs, and I'd never been in prison, and I never was in the mafia, never killed anybody, so I probably won't be able to, to, to have a testimony because I saw those guys come by. But I know what you're saying. You, you keep in the Word. You stay in the Word. You, you find a way to, to live your life right before God. But you also have an ability to relate to them, maybe like I couldn't. And I think maybe that's what God is using you to do. Well, today. no doubt my testimony uh, does make an impression upon them. And I'll, I'll spend an hour each day on campus uh, sharing my life experience and what God delivered me out of them. And many of them find it very difficult to believe that God could make such well, a what is God doing on transformation the uh, on what's the he, campuses what's he doing? today. What's he doing on the campuses? Uh, well, I believe uh, there is a renewal of interest in, in religion and Christianity on the college and university campuses today. And, and I think uh, also some Christians on campus are beginning to get the uh, vision that, uh, you know, the Bible does have some answers to contemporary problems and issues in our society today. And that's one of the main messages I'm trying to get across to the Christian students on campus, that they need to get activated, involved in the uh, uh, issues of the day. As far as the alcoholism and the drug scene, I mean, that's still very much a part of the contemporary society today. How do you, how do you talk about that? How do you, you say, well, here's where I was and here's what's happening, but how do you Well, how do you I talk tell about it this way. Is? My favorite text for the university campuses is 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. And I'll go to the middle of campus and begin this way. Be not deceived. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor adulterers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, be not deceived. The Bible warns us, drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither the effeminate nor homosexual shall inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> so, so the answer is repentance, turning completely from Amen. sin, and living a life of obedience to the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. We preach the law of God to the students so they can have a knowledge of sin. I like he's the prophet Isaiah walking on the campus and proclaiming the word of God and the day of the Lord. What kind of response do you get? I mean, you're going to get a mixed response. Yeah. But but basically, what do you Well, get? typically, there'll be a lot of mocking, laughter, ridicule, but nevertheless, there'll be students standing out there hour after hour after hour listening. These meetings will last uh, usually for four and a half uh, to five hours. And of course, we do get uh, conversions. The most interesting conversion in my uh, ministry, I was preaching at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and there was a young girl in the crowd named Cindy, and she mocked and laughed, and I finally pointed her out of the crowd and said, repent of your sins, you wicked woman. Well, at the time, she just laughed it off, uh, and I left campus but returned a year later. Meanwhile, she had become chief reporter for the student newspaper, The Alligator, and uh, she wanted to do an interview with me, and I was able to minister to the Word to her personally and eventually led her uh, to her, uh, a knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, and, and uh, she began to witness with us on campus. Now, we left the university and, and went to other campuses, and the Lord would move upon Cindy to go out in the middle of the campus and preach one, uh, once a week that? herself. <laughs> uh, and then she uh, went off on the circuit, traveled on the campuses on her own for four years, Greyhound bus, and 
course, the epilogue of the story is that wow. uh, four years ago, this girl ended up uh, being my wife. And of course, it's <laughs> 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 my <laughs> wildest imagination when I first heard you. Thought she'd end up being my wife. Isn't that something? Well, that's the way God does things. Is that uh, in your ministry today, and the things that God is doing in, in your ministry, what would you want us to pray for that God uh, do for you and, and in your ministry that that we could help you? Because I, you know, PTL and and these people here, I, I tell you, I believe in the prayers of these partners. And sometimes uh, we have guests on, and, and I fail to do this, to say, what can we pray for you about that you need us to pray with you about that God can do for you in your ministry? Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I've just moved my family to Columbus, Ohio, and we're going to uh, concentrate uh, this fall on Ohio State University uh, to build a ministry on that campus. <laughs> because I've been traveling Ohio. to universities for 13 years, going from university to university. I've been on over 500 campuses. But they're over... 3,500 universities and colleges in America. And so if we're really going to reach the students, I've got to train people to do what I've been doing. So I'm going to build a training center to train Christians to stand up boldly, to rise up. My, the text of my book is, is from Psalm 94, verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Yeah. And I'm convinced there'll be a true revival in our land when those that name the name of Christ begin to speak out and cry out against everything that is wicked and evil and take a real stand for righteousness and Thank holiness. God. Thank God. Doug, I want you to, to pray for Jed and his ministry and for other ministries across this land who are, well, who are going, uh, going at it full force and yet facing so many mountains that are so difficult to climb. 35, how many? 3,500 3, college universities. No way you can touch them hmm. unless God intervenes. That's and, right. And you are partners. Uh, Gary mentioned it briefly a moment ago. Hey, it is extremely important that you join your hearts. This is where, this is where the family of God becomes a tremendous powerhouse. We can't do it without you. But when the family gets together, Lord, we look at the insurmountable task of reaching these 3,500 universities for you. But you took just a few men and women in an upper room and turned the world upside down. Jed has a dream. He's given his life to that dream. Now you've given him direction. We ask, Lord, for miracles as he goes to Ohio State University. The opposition is going to be un unbelievable, but if your spirit goes with him, we know that the world, the campus world, is going to be changed. We pray, Lord, for the other ministries that are out there that need your help so desperately. Give them wisdom. Give them guidance. And we know that in the long run, we're all going to receive victory. Thank you for our partners who pray day in and day out for the needs of this program. We praise your name for that which will be accomplished because of their prayers. Amen. Thank you, Jed. The book is Who Will Rise Up?